Hi, welcome. For those of you that are here, it is 545 on a Tuesday, and we are roughly two and a half miles from the Venetian and Palazzo, I think. So if you're here, you've got your step goal met, you've got your activity goal met, congratulations. Uh, and thank you for making the journey. Um, my name is Ryan Seaman. I'm the worldwide head of enterprise transformation programs at AWS. Um, I've been at AWS for the past eight years uh, in a variety of roles. Um, everything from professional services, pr principal SA, I worked inside of our service teams, I call it my behind the curtain days, but I've spent the last four years mainly focused on helping large, large enterprise customers of AWS transform in a business fashion on top of AWS. Um, I'm gonna be doing some talking today. We're gonna to reserve most of the time for Adam Thornton. Thank you for joining us today. Adam is the head of disruptive innovation at Lockheed Martin Aeronautics. Um, and he's gonna tell you about his journey and his story uh, partnering up with my team uh, and our support team from AWS, including Robin, who's down here in the front row, uh, who we love dearly. Um, so the Enterprise Transformation Program itself uh, is a program that we designed several years ago in its tagline is that it is AWS's comprehensive approach to help you achieve your business goals and transform into a modern digital business. And the reason that we built that tagline is because we know many people this week are gonna be playing buzzword bingo, and that fills up quite a bit of your buzzword bingo card. But the reality is the Enterprise Transformation Program is an offering that we created at AWS because we have more and more customers coming to us that aren't just talking about migrating to the cloud, but they wanna to move to the cloud with purpose, and they want all of the benefits of the cloud. And the reality is, is to get the benefits of the cloud, it's not just about using new technology, it's about changing the way you do things while leveraging new technology to make it easier. And so what we did inside of the Enterprise Transformation Team is we actually went through a lot of our large customer journeys into AWS over the past eight years. So customers like Capital One and GE and News Corp, Cisco Systems, John Deere, Enel, uh, BP, and a handful of others. And we actually looked at the things that we did and that our partners did with customers to help them move to the cloud. And not only move to the cloud, but start transforming their business and start transforming, in some of these cases, their actual industry and the way that they function and the way they serve customers. And so what we did is we codified those learnings and put them into a single offering so that customers that are looking to really get groundswell and really come top down at the same time would have some prescription from AWS and have a guided story from AWS that's actually been tried and true and that we know should be successful. As part of that process, what we've identified is probably the most important learning in those customer journeys, which is that your journey to the cloud based on transformation has to be solidified and has to be aligned within your leadership team on what are the real big benefits you wanna get from the cloud. TCO reduction for IT and centralized IT is always part of the story but it's not the main driver that inspires the rest of the organization to change the way that they work and to change the way that they've built processes and practices and policies within the organization to achieve a greater outcome. And so we highlight some of those things here, right? Business and operational insights, right? Every organization talks about identifying new ways to use their legacy data and their historical information to make better decisions not only in the future or on really big decisions, but in everyday decisions. If we look at business operations cost and optimization, we spend a lot of time at AWS with customers talking about IT cost optimization. It turns out most of our enterprise customers spend a lot more on business operations than they do on technology operations. So while we will help reduce your technology operations, if we can use new innovation and new products and new services to also reduce the cost of your business operations, we can provide a much greater benefit back to our customers and back to the organizations. And I think the big two at the end are the accelerate time to revenue. I think everybody is looking for ways to increase uh, market capture, get to the market faster with new products, 
build digital solutions in new ways, et cetera, et cetera. And then the last one is the scaling of the organization, creating the right skill sets and the right culture within your organization to truly accelerate. So all of that, and I'm going to be super transparent, is very high level and a little bit fluffy, right? And so people hear these talks, and what they get from these talks is like, there's some academic philosopher in the back room drawing on a whiteboard that knows nothing about how enterprises actually function. And that's why today we're gonna to spend the majority of our middle segment hearing from somebody that's actually done this in a really large, very complex, highly regulated organization to actually get moving off the ground. To get these things done, you have to accelerate your journey through experience. We have to find ways to pick really big targets, align our executive teams to them, and push the needle forward by proving everybody wrong that we can do things way faster than we ever thought that we could. What we've put together inside of our enterprise transformation programs is the recipe that we believe is helping customers be successful in those really strategic pushes. But what we really need to do is validate those things with customers and so what I really want to do next is turn this over to Adam for the next 30 minutes or so to tell you about their journey and how they've accelerated through all of this launching, all the launching points and the challenge points within the organization to overcome those first set of hurdles to build momentum and get the flywheel rolling. We'll spend about 30, 30 minutes here. Total session, we'll look about 45 minutes Adam and I would both love to save 10 to 15 minutes at the end to open up and ask questions. Uh, we're happy to answer questions. This is a big conversation topic, so we can't get real deep in all of the different details. But if you have some detailed questions towards the end, we are super happy to answer them. And with that, let me turn it over to Adam Thornton. Thank you very much for that, Ryan. So thank you for allowing me to be here. Thank you for listening to the story. Uh, this has been the last year and a half of my life, so this is uh, something that I can speak ad nauseum to. I can speak at great length about all of this stuff. Now, I loved what you said, Ryan, about uh, proving people wrong. That almost sounds disruptive to me, so that, that immediately jumped out at me. So my name is Adam Thornton. I am the Disruptive Innovation Lead for Lockheed Martin, specifically our aeronautics business area. We've got four business areas around the globe. Uh, aeronautics, where I am, where we focus on fighter jets like the F-35, F-22, F-16. We also have cargo jets like the C-130 Hercules. Uh, we also have our ADP environment, our advanced development program. Some of you, if you've never heard of Skunk Works, that's a great Google. Go down that rabbit hole. It's a, it's a fun one for you. So we've got ADP as well. Uh, and then we also have some other business areas. We've got representation in the room here from missiles and fire control, where we have missiles that uh, we had a couple of sessions yesterday on, on what's going on at Missiles and Fire Control with partnership with AWS. We also have rotary mission systems, so think of that as the Black Hawk helicopter. And then we have our space business area, so satellites and all that kind of fun stuff. So we've got to reach all over the globe and all over the United States, installations all over the world. About 114,000 employees worldwide. And so I've got a nice little video that's kind of walked through some of what's important to us at Lockheed Martin. A better intro for some of those of you who may not be familiar with Lockheed and why it's important that we stay ahead of ready. Protecting what matters most is the mission that matters most. At Lockheed Martin, we know today's battlefront is behind, above, and below. So no matter where the threat comes from, we make sure you stay ahead of it. Out here, we understand that every piece of the all-domain puzzle must fit together perfectly so that you can defend our shared values and own the contested battle space. That's why we've spent decades building and connecting the platforms you need to dominate every domain across air, land, sea, space, and cyber. We've created technologies that unite disparate and complex systems so you can sense, make sense, and act, protecting in the same moment you detect. And to safeguard that advantage, we're integrating digital engineering, AI, and 5G technology into the field and within our own walls. Everything we do is in service of what you do and why you do it. Your mission is a safer, more secure world. Our promise is to help make it happen by connecting the software to the hardware to everywhere, ensuring those we serve always stay ahead of ready. 
So that's a pretty cool video uh, that, that shows a little bit of what we are, what we do, why it's important, uh, protecting the men and women in the field, giving them the best capabilities and the best chance of coming home safely. It's something that we take very seriously, so I'm incredibly passionate about what we're doing. And we've got 100 years of legacy and processes and a lot of things that are going on that are so great that built up this foundation for this company. So what we are trying to focus on is how we build up the next 100 years of global dominance and global security. And so that's what we've really focused on with this partnership. So a little bit more about why the need for the change. And as Ryan even said, we've got a lot of buzzword bingo in this, and you heard a whole bunch of it in, even in that video. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna say that you're not gonna hear a bunch of those words from me because you absolutely will. Um, there's a lot of truth behind it though. So when we look at what we're trying to develop, you saw some of that in the video, of why this is so important. Uh, that we cannot fail, we cannot have mishaps, we cannot have mistakes. Um, it's so important that in the, in the geopolitical climate that we have every defense fully secured. Security is always top of mind. Well, as that happens, we have this growing need for programs, platforms, new products that are going to build the future for Lockheed Martin. Each and every one of those in this world that we live in today with technology advancements is becoming more complex. Every single one of them is incredibly integrated, complex, very convoluted, very complicated, and it's making our job a lot harder on how we roll these out faster, more streamlined, quicker, easier, cheaper, uh, and we can check all of those boxes along the way. That's one of the things that we're absolutely trying to drive toward here. At the same time, we're doing a lot of this where we're struggling with support, I'll say it. We've got staffing issues where we're really struggling with what do we train folks up on? What do we need them to go learn? How do they learn this to make them more effective at their jobs? We've been driving a lot of these capabilities into our big monolithic systems. So think of that as your PLMs, your MES, your ERP systems. We're driving a lot of capabilities into those platforms, which makes them inherently more complex, which means that the support staff needs to be more capable. They need to know the buzzwords. They need to know the technical terms. So we've got that as a, as a nice little problem statement to set up. And then the world in which we live, the buzzword bingo, emerging trends, keeping up with things like DevOps and Agile and all of these other automation and all these other fun words, AI, sure, let's throw some of that in there too. It's this wonderful cake that we're, that we're baking. So there's all of this that's kind of coming together and right there at this wonderful inflection point is what we dubbed our IT's, our inter, or excuse me, our IT organization's digital transformation. How are we going to evolve what we are doing so that we are ahead of ready for our internal customers who can then build the, those capabilities better, faster, cheaper, stronger for our external customers, DOD, the DIB, et cetera. So that's that perfect inflection point. And so we, we colloquially dub this Moonshot. It's the program that we, we launched as part of this. And we said it's DT for IT. This is where we took a lot of those emerging trends. We took a lot of what was going on in the marketplace, the program support, the need for change, and it all kind of coalesced right there in that beautiful uh, center of the circle. There's, a big part of this that we as the IT organization, we have to be an enabler. We want to be an enabler. We've got to make sure that our support is as seamless across the board as possible so that we can do this for any program at any business area across the board. What we build at Aeronautics right now, specific to some of the programs that I've mentioned earlier, I want to be able to take that and replicate that easily at missiles and fire control at rotary mission systems or at our space business area. What we're starting at Aero with our enterprise transformation program, with that partnership, what we are starting there is going to expand into the rest of Lockheed Martin. Uh, so all across the board. So that, that kind of lays out the problem statement or the opportunity statement of where we, where we started. So whenever we jumped into, well, why enterprise transformation? So this, this all came about about a year and a half ago. I was sitting down and I was talking with Robin uh, my AWS counterpart, and if you don't have a Robin, you need a Robin. Uh, because whenever we talk about partnerships and having a partner and a company who enables you, that's the definition of it. I call her with everything, and she said, you know what, I think I have a couple of ideas. This was not something that we had a really prescriptive approach. This wasn't something that I could, I could just lob over the wall and say, okay, well, we're doing another cloud migration strategy. We're gonna try to do this. We're gonna go uh, kick off this project and see what we can get DevOpsified. I did that on purpose. 
we, we intentionally said, this is much, much bigger. This is not only changing, like Ryan said, this is not just changing what we are building. This is changing how we are building it and how we are going to build everything in the future. So it really is huge. So we had to think really big with this. This is not just a migration acceleration program. This is not your typical prescription for success that we're, we're going for. This is a structured program, and that's what we learned very quickly. This is a structured approach, but it can be fluid. Choose the elements that are going to be most impactful for you and really dive deep into those and make it work for you. We had executive buy-in. That was such a key to this. Um, the CIO at Aeronautics, she bought in on this and said, Adam, if you want to go do it, just go do it. And don't be wrong, but deliver. And that's whew, a little... Uh, I felt the goosebumps on the back of my on the back of my neck from that, but it was it was really impactful. It was really meaningful to me that we had that executive buy-in all the way from the top, and we looked at the enterprise transformation program. We looked at the streams, and we understood this is going to be the perfect fit for us. And we'll we'll just jump into the deep end, and we'll figure out how to make this work for us. So where did we start? So we started. I keep turning on the laser, so that's kind of fun. <laughs> Where we started, we got that executive alignment. And the way that the ETP started for us was we sat down, we brought in key stakeholders, key leaders from all over Lockheed Martin, uh, specifically in our IT landscape. And we said, okay, everybody, it's the holiday season. Let's just capture your wish list. What do you want to go do? What do you want to deliver? Transformation, scale, all these great things. And we started coming up with all kinds of great stuff. So we've got, you'll see it up here, one LM, so that we build it once, we share it everywhere. Classified cloud, sounds awesome, let's do it. Enterprise data lake, yeah, let's get some of that. And let's go ahead and sprinkle a service catalog on there too, and let's have some fun with it. This is how we got started, and there was a tremendous groundswell, a lot of momentum that built up once we kicked off this program. And we th started thinking, okay, with a partnership like AWS, with the enterprise transformation program, we can go and we can tackle all of these. These still feel very tactical, though. These are the deliveries. These are the outcomes that we wanted to, we wanted to achieve. But really and truly, this still sounds like we're doing a little bit of buzzword bingo. So what we ended up doing, and this, was, this only speaks to the strength of Ryan's team and the product that they have with the ETP. We said, man, this is great stuff but I need to, I really need to hit a home run with a project that's in flight. I, I need to just knock this one out of the park and then we can come back. So let's park these four topics, let's put them on the backlog and let's go knock out this project that I've already got in flight called Moonshot because I've got a real problem space, a real opportunity, frame of mind, where we can go and impact some serious change across the organization and we can see the benefits. And once we do that, every one of these things we're gonna pick them back up and it's gonna be so much easier because we've already won the hearts, the minds, we've changed the culture, we've done all of this and it's been perfect as we've done it. So that's where we kind of said, cool, thanks Ryan, this is awesome, um, but we need to drill into Moonshot. And so uh, I kind of alluded to it on the last chart or two charts ago, let's dive into a little bit of Moonshot. So for anyone who is techie like me, you're probably gonna love this, anybody who is not, Bear with me, because I'm gonna nerd out a little bit and you're gonna have some fun. So Moonshot, what did we start with for Moonshot? I mentioned it's that wonderful convergence of those three things. We sat down and we started thinking huge with this. We said, look, we've got new programs that whenever we wanna push an update into a program space, we wanna update ERP into a program. That might take anywhere from three and a half to four months for an update for one application, for one instance. That doesn't work in today's society. We have to be better, we have to be faster. So how are we gonna do that? So we kicked off Moonshot, and that was where we said, okay, we're gonna go do this. Easiest way to do this, you know what? We are going to put ERP in a container. I swear to you, we sat down and we said, we're gonna put ERP in a container. We're gonna put our PLM system in a container. We're gonna put our MES system in a container. And we're gonna have all of these be rubber stamp anywhere so that we can deploy these quickly, easily, affordably all over the entire corporation. That was where we started. Admittedly, whenever we say think big, that's whenever you immediately get hit in the face with reality, that's what happened. Containers, cool, we aren't there yet. But we knew we could get there, so where can you start instead of doing containers? Let's start with just basic automation. 
So that's what we looked at for automation. But if we're talking about how we're going to automate things, we need a framework for how we're going to do that. That's Moonshot. So Moonshot is our framework for how we automate the deployment of environments and what flows to those environments. And as we started unpacking that, that led us to this pyramid that you see on the screen where we've got, not only do we have to build out the environments, now we've got to build out the core automation that sits on those environments, and then we can get all the way up to the ERPs, the MESs, the PLM systems, where you're going to see a lot of really huge transformational value, pardon the buzzword. So that was what we started with, with Moonshot. And our goal here, all across the board, was we want to see 10x. Everywhere across the board, 10x. You'll hear more on that later. So this is, at a very high level, this is the overview of what we started building with Moonshot. And just today, yeah, you can see, six plus months to two and a half weeks. This also incorporated procurement times, lead times, software development times, board approval times, all kinds of stuff that just slows everything down and just grates at my soul. So if we're talking to me, it's true. Uh, so if we're talking about Moonshot, let's go ahead and start unpacking some of these layers. So let's start with the environments layer. So in the environments layer, we've got to build all this up. This is where we said, oh my gosh, let's leverage the power of the cloud. Let's leverage a partner like AWS. Everything that AWS does so well, let's just bring it in and let's build on top of that. Building environments quickly, rapidly, cheaply, um, and seamlessly so that they are fully repeatable across the board, let's do that. And let's do it really, really, really fast. So we went from four months down to a week. This had all our, in our integrated security, so we got all our boring security. If there are any security folks in here, sorry. Uh, they're the ones that we always fight with because I like to go fast and they like to say no. So we don't, we don't, we don't work out too well. So we had to do this across the board. We had to do this with all of our environments. And we had to build this as quickly, cheaply, and easily as fast as, as humanly possible. Uh, you can see a lot of the buzzwords on there. We also had some fun stuff. Uh, I didn't even remember this until we were going through the slide review about the AppStream integration. We did so much stuff with AppStream that we looked at that and we said, OK, we're going to go do all this stuff. And you'll hear me talk a lot about what happens at the server level. We completely neglected for a long time the client piece of it. So we started saying, well, we're going to have to incorporate clients at some point. How do we do that? Oh, here you go. Here's AppStream. And we can put your PLM systems in AppStream, and we can stand this up for you very seamlessly, very f fully integrated, and get you up and running in a matter of minutes. So that was a huge win for us as well. So this is the environments where we built this up from the ground, and we saw a lot of, a lot of positive results on that. Let's go up a layer. This was the one that we all overlooked as well, kind of like I mentioned that we overlooked our client pieces. Well, if you're going to automate stuff, and you're going to automate it on top of AWS um, with the intention of this is going to go anywhere, meaning this is going to go from AWS, our development environments that we've strung together, this is going to end up back on-prem because we've got a lot of this stuff that, frankly, cannot be in the cloud yet because uh, we haven't built that classified cloud. Uh, so we've got to be able to take a lot of this stuff and bring it back on-prem and host it in our VMware, vSphere environments, et cetera. So we had to build this in a, pl a platform agnostic way. So we aren't using CFTs. As much as it pains me to say this, we're not building this cloud native. We had to build this so that it was fully platform agnostic. So we had to focus on Ansible and Terraform uh, instead of CFTs or cloud formation templates. We did all of that, but if you want to be able to run these automations, you got to put the stuff out there to run the automations. So this is where we had to install and had to automate GitLab and Nexus and all of our pipeline stuff, our Ansible towers, get our Terraform installations out there so that we do have the underlying or underpinning foundation for how we're going to run these automations. Uh, we, we, whether you want to say eating your own dog, for, dog food or drinking your own champagne, that's what we were focusing on here. And these were things that we didn't think of, because whenever you're standing up a new environment, you just tell Jim over here, hey, go install the stuff that I need to run my stuff. And they do that, and then you focus on the stuff that, that the business needs, your PLMs, your MES, et cetera. So we had, to take some, uh, we had to take a couple of lumps to say, no, we really do need to focus on building out the core automation, the core layer of what's going on there. 
this wasn't a big, big gain. You can see we went from one to two weeks of doing it manually because these are all small tools and installing GitLab doesn't take much. It's pretty easy. Get, installing Ansible Tower, pretty easy. So automating it didn't take a whole lot of time and once you deploy it, it really didn't provide a tremendous value, but it was necessary and if we're gonna do it, we need to at least abide by it. And the last layer, this is the one that is the oh my gosh chart. We really did. We automated PLM, ERP, MES, and if you're not familiar with those, product lifecycle management, manufacturing execution system, uh, ERP, enterprise resource planning, um, IOF, our interoperability framework, so how these applications all talk to each other. We call it an IOF. Most people from 10, 15 years ago probably call it an ESB. Uh, it's a lot of those same kind of things, microservices, et cetera, API connections. Uh, and then we also had EDW, our enterprise data warehouse. These are the big, some people will call them the big six because we have two PLM systems. So we, we call them the big six. But we said, yeah, we've got to automate these. And yeah, we still want to containerize these and make it so that they really are cookie cutter. But if we can't containerize it yet, then let's go ahead and let's focus on the automation of the installation, the configuration, because who works with it straight out of the box? No, none of us do. We all have our own little special sauce that we put on it that makes everything really complicated whenever you try to make that repeatable over and over and over hundreds of times. So we wanted to automate that as well. And then we wanted to automate the integration. So how these applications communicate with the IOF and how they communicate across each of these applications. So starting with just the automation of the installation, I know it's a lot of shuns on there. So as we started with that, you can see some of these eye-watering numbers at the bottom of the chart. These are real numbers. Now a lot of these are wall clock times versus board approvals and security approvals and things that are incredibly laborious. But just across the board, each of these, we've seen 90 plus percent reductions just by automating these. And these were things that, yeah, we always said, some guy like me probably before me said, yeah, I wanna, I wanna containerize PLM, cool. And then got completely stifled because he didn't have a partnership. He didn't have an enterprise transformation program. He didn't have AWS at the ready to, to go and enable this and to make this happen. We do. And that's how we've been able to succeed thus far. So we're taking our deployment times two and a half months. That three and a half month lead time that I said for an upgrade, we're going to be able to push these in minutes now. Going to be. We're still building it. And as you can imagine, doing all of this is incredibly complex. That was why we needed something like enterprise transformation. Because every bit of this is hard. And one of, the, one of my favorite sayings, and I'm sure it resonates with everyone in the audience, with a company like Lockheed, and I'll own this, we do the hard things really well. We do the easy things really hard. So this is where pull in a partner and let them do what they do best and help them or let them accelerate us. One of the other things that I'm, I want to focus on here uh, automated testing. So the other thing that we did with this, whenever we started this, and this was just one of the other really nice uh, motherhood and apple pie kind of things that came out of this. It doesn't get represented on a chart like this, but it still is a good news story. Whenever we started this, we said, yeah, we need to start injecting some DevOps mindset, some, uh, some cloud ability mindset into each of our teams. Because these are typically teams that are, we call them the arts, uh, these teams, they don't have that development mindset. They don't have the mindset that things can be better. You can automate this, you can do this. They don't have that mindset. So we've had to try to work to win over the hearts and minds of these, of these organizations by doing this. Well, one of the areas where we knew we could see tremendous benefit was automated testing. So we just said, okay, what are the things that you do day in, day out whenever you have a new environment or you're needing to test an upgrade? Let's go ahead and start looking at those things and let's get some automated test scripts going. Automated testing, it's not flashy, it's not glamorous, but my goodness, does it, br it bring back some serious ROI. So we had some thread tests that, uh, actually I'll cover that in one of the next charts, because I'll get to that one in a second. So here you go, we've got our automated installations, we've done all of this stuff, and we've reduced our cycle time down to one to two days. Huge value. And like I mentioned before, everything that we are doing, this is just for our aeronautics business area. Once we get this, then we're able to share this with missiles and fire control and our buddy Greg, 
uh, with everything that's going on over there. We're able to share it with the folks in space. We're able to share it with RMS. And so anybody is going to be able to use this. And in fact, the Moonshot platform now is the best practice for Lockheed Martin that will be incorporated into all delivery pipelines for all of these monolithic applications, which is pretty cool. So some of the successes, I've touched on this, and this is where you get a lot of those really cool VP level metrics that, uh, that make everybody happy. Yeah, you know, it's six plus months down to one to two or two weeks. Um, lots and lots of value. I told you we shot for 10X because whenever we kicked this off, we didn't know what we were gonna be able to accomplish. We didn't know how good it could get. We just knew it had to get better than it was. And so that's what we focused on. Let's go ahead and put a banner in the sky, 10X. That's what we wanna accomplish. And then on the previous chart, you saw 90 plus percent. So we're clearly on the right path. And we still haven't containerized it yet. So we're gonna see even better benefits once we do that. And this just speaks to the, the partnership. So I mentioned the thread tests a moment ago. We have these thread tests that, as we're talking about automated testing, test-driven development, uh, regression testing, smoke testing, all of the things that are on this continuum of testing. We're trying to kind of whet the appetite of each of these development teams saying, these are things that are available to you and we want you to be able to incorporate these into your product life cycles, into your development life cycles. Once we started that, there was obviously gonna be some resistance. No, I'm fine, don't, don't give us, I've got my own DevOps, I don't need yours. A lot of silliness like that. Once we got started, and we started seeing the results of a thread test which connected our PLM environment to our MES environment to our ERP environment and then pass that transaction back to our MES environment and then pass that back to our PLM environment to close out the transaction. It's an incredibly laborious test that they said, yeah, it's gonna be cool if we can do that. So we did it. And at the end of that, that test encompassed something like 1,200 screen or 1,200 transactions, 600 screens across all of these applications, incredibly involved. Every single time that that test is run, it saves something like $450,000 in person labor. Huge value, and that's one test. So that told us we've got a lot that we can really continue to harp on here and, draw, and dive even deeper into with our partnership. And one of the biggest things that came out of that, one of the coolest benefits, was that same team that said, no, we're, we're fine, we don't need to do this. We don't need to do any automated testing. We're not gonna worry about any of that. They came back to us and they said, okay, we saw the results and now the team is asking, what else can we automate? So that let us know, not only are we delivering tremendous value with our partnership and the automations that we're pushing forward as part of the Moonshot framework, we're also changing the culture, we're changing the mindset. We're winning over the hearts and minds of some of the folks and showing them that yes, there truly can be a better tomorrow. So at the end of this, this was, and I loved this chart, whenever Ryan had the idea for this chart, brilliant. Transformation, buzzword bingo, sounds great. Yeah, whatever. This was not transformation for transformation's sake. This was survival. We needed to change. We needed to have clear objectives. We did. We needed to focus on the objectives. Building these platforms, building these programs in the most automated fashion, seamlessly, affordably. And of course, we had some expert guidance along the way. I told you, whenever we, we started this, it was, give me all the AWS I can drink. I'm gonna love it and we're gonna be fat and happy with it. And then we got started and it was, okay, this, this may be a little too fast, I, I might have heard about a thousand times, trust the process. Uh, so we, we did, but we did have to kind of peel that back a little bit. So we said, yeah, these are great, but we're gonna put these on the backlog. They're still on the backlog because Moonshot is that big and we really wanna hit a home run. And you can tell we're on the path to hitting a home run. But we used a lot of those Amazonian principles to get us started. And you can tell, you can feel it with the groups and the teams today and the organization. You can feel that the tide is turning. They're embracing the automation, they're embracing the new mindset, they're embracing every bit of this. And in everything that we're doing, we're measuring and reporting on that value. You heard Ryan talk about TCO. Oh my gosh, we've talked TCO for days. That's not the key thing that we're doing here. We're reporting on the value that we're driving, the value to our internal customer, and then the value to our external customer. Are we building the most capable aircraft possible so that we can maintain and stay ahead of ready? This is how we do it. 
So this is the partnership with Lockheed and my organization, Disruptive Innovation, uh, which is a cool title. I was able to name my own org, which is always kind of fun. So if you don't have a partner, a Robin, if you don't have that, if you don't feel that, if you don't have someone investing in your company the way that AWS has invested in Lockheed Martin, get that. Because that's how you're going to get there. That's how you will stay ahead of ready in each of your companies. Thank you, sir. So, like real world examples of overcoming the challenges of traditional enterprise with thousands and thousands of people inside of your organization that are operating under existing practices and policies and processes that have lots of red tape and lots of SLAs and lots of past things to the next person to have accountability. But the reality is, is in these scenarios, what we have to do is we have to start simple and we have to start practical. And so what we do inside of the Enterprise Transformation Program and how we've enabled Lockheed Martin to move as fast as they are and start expanding outside of the aeronautics business and into uh, the space business and into the mission and fire control businesses, et cetera, is that we help our customers by putting together everything that we've done historically with customers. So over the last eight years, we've built a lot of point solutions inside of AWS and inside of our large partner network, specifically our large GSIs, to help customers. But what we've done is we've said, hey, do you want to do innovation? We have a digital innovation program. Do you need to do migrations? We have a migration acceleration program. Do you need to have secure landing, landing zones and environments? We have security epics from professional services and we have great partners with security practices built within them. Do you need to do data and analytics? We have a data-driven everything program. Do you need to get experience for your developers? We have experience-based acceleration offerings. And so many of our customers are frustrated and a little bit confused because we have a thousand offerings, but we've always asked customers to figure out how to put those offerings together to get something done. What we've done inside of this and what we've executed with customers like Lockheed Martin and Nationwide and Takeda Pharmaceutical and others is we've put those things together in the order of operations that they should be done and then we've centered them into six key spaces that we think about as work streams and that we think about as the key capabilities that if we can build capability like this inside of the large enterprise space, you'll have the self-sustainability to run these things on your own going forward, reducing the dependency on programs and offerings from AWS and increasing your ability to make your own decisions at the right time to run and manage your business. And so if you go across these six, you look at things like business. When Adam showed the chart of the four quadrant bo box with all of the drawings and the visioning to bring the executive alignment team together, that's our executive visioning program. And so we start the business track with that. Because what we wanna do is we wanna do two things. We wanna align your executives on what it is the business outcomes they wanna achieve are. And then we wanna make sure that they're actually saying the same words and having the same meaning. So we've had plenty of customers that we've started the process with where we found out the executives aren't actually aligned on the outcomes they need to do and we help them solve that. We also have scenarios where CIOs need to earn the trust of other peers within the organization to get the organization bought into going down the journey. Uh, inside of the foundation work stream, Adam talked about the fact that we built the environments that they operate in right now with a lot of very critical workloads in two days. We have an experience-based acceleration offering called the Platform Accelerator, and in two days' time, we can bring people into the, into the organization and help you build environments that are ready, that are scalable, and that are operatable. Right? Things that you can manage downstream without having to add lots and lots of headcount because they're built on top of automation. In the modernization space, we focus on how we're gonna modernize your key workloads. So the idea of AppStream, AppStream 2.0, containers, uh, building automation not just for your infrastructure but also for your software, building in automated testing, all of that falls into our modernization practice. Uh, inside of innovation, which is some of the pieces that we're starting to get to now with Lockheed, is innovation and the insights pieces, where we bring our own ways of working from Amazon. We use our digital innovation programs. We teach you how to work backwards from customers. We teach you how to get executive sponsorship. We teach you how to get buy-in and funding to do things the same way that Amazon operates its business inside of our four walls. And the same is true for insights. So if you look at uh, the insights programs that we use, data-driven everything, and our data warehousing programs. We use this at Nationwide to actually build an enterprise-governed data lake across all of their legacy data over 100 years 
and they use it now to manage usage-based insurance and also using analytics AI ML technologies to actually build forecasting policies for customers where they can give you a policy recommendation just by, the, just by understanding the business category that you run for small and medium businesses. To do this, we execute the program over three phases. We start very simple and very practical, and our goal inside of this whole thing is to drive change and culture change. And the way that you drive culture change is through experience. If you look at any adult learning theories, you'll see that the majority of learning for adults does not come from sessions like these. It does not come from reading. It does not come from books. It actually comes from hands-on experience. And so what we do is in this process, we quickly drive alignment in the prioritization phase across your executive team that faces up to and acknowledges where the toughest challenges are going to be for you as a business to actually do the transformation, achieve the outcomes that you need to achieve and validate that everybody's aligned to the outcomes. We've had customers that we've run through prioritization phase, come out of the end of prioritization phase, acknowledge that they're not actually aligned on the outcomes they want to achieve, let them take a break, go back, socialize, meet with their board, meet with their strategy executives, align on what the outcomes are, and then come back and restart the program later. In the activation phase, we do what I like to call is running water through the pipes to flush out where the problems are. So in that activation phase, we actually run experience-based accelerators and we run activities and workshops. We do real migrations, we build real environments, we set up operations. But what we do is we do it in a way that we flush out where are the policies and where are the processes and where are the skill gaps in the organization that are gonna cause the most challenges down the long stream. And so what it allows us to do is to take a very long list of assumptions that we usually would build into a long transformation strategy. And because we get quickly to, hand, quickly to keyboards in doing real work, we can take the assumption list and actually shrink it down to these are the actual places where we've run into problems and these are the specific problems you're gonna have. It can be problems, we've run into customers where they told us one of the biggest things that they want to do is become more customer centric and work back from customers so that they know the solutions they're building they're gonna work for their customers. When we ran water through the pipes with our digital innovation practices, we actually found out they had a policy that said that their people are not allowed to talk to customers. The only way they could talk to customers was by going through a third party. And to go through the third party, you actually had to go to procurement to talk to the third party about talking to the customers. And so it extended this process of getting feedback from customers literally by months. But going through this process in the second phase, you actually get the data that you need about your organization and about the way you're currently operating so you can take it back to your leadership team and you can actually tackle the hard challenges that are in front of you so that you can address them for the long haul. Otherwise, these things kind of, I know if your experience has been like mine, I worked in the enterprise space for a very long time before joining AWS. It's like these things are just kind of like under the current and they're constantly nagging at you. This process that we use in the second phase of the program lifts all of those things up to the surface and shines a light on them. And now we can address them with the leadership team and say, if you really want to get to these outcomes, these are the big, tough decisions we're going to have to make. And then our teams from AWS and partners will actually help you get through those things when you commit to doing them. If we move on down the line into the third phase, what we actually do is coming out of your activation phase, we've built what your transformation strategy should look like. We've identified which workloads need to be modernized so that you can actually do innovation in the future. Unlock your historical data. Make sure that your core workloads, ERP platforms, EDW platforms, PLM platforms, those types of things have been modernized so you can build API engagements with them and allow, allow innovation teams to build interactive APIs with those systems and make that data available to analysts to actually drive the future. We actually build your strategy for which, what to move, why to move it, the type of movement that you should have, and where we're gonna start building innovative teams that are actually building your data and insights, your AI ML, your innovative products, your customer experience products of the future, and then we align that with the resourcing plan that's going to execute against it. And so the whole theory of the program is actually built in a quarterly cycle, where what we wanna do is we wanna get aligned on what we're gonna do, execute quickly, 
use the experience that we've had, the offerings that we have, the programs that we have, the services that we have to accelerate the journey and see around those corners so that we can tell you what you're probably gonna run into next because we've seen it with lots of other customers. And so we've used this approach now for the past four years very, very quietly. And the reason is, is the majority of the places we're actually running the enterprise transformation program is with really large, really strategic customers. And in that space, we're really cautious and thoughtful. And so we've been methodical about using the program, the offerings, the structure, and the learnings to actually make sure that it's going to work. Because when we're doing these engagements with customers, we're looking for customers that are placing big bets. And when you place a big bet on Amazon and AWS, we want to make sure those things are going to be successful. So working across these executive peerings, we're often talking to CEOs, CFOs, COOs, CIOs, CTOs, et cetera, about what these things are going to produce. And I think to Adam's point early in the conversation, when he told a CIO, you know, we're going to go do this thing, and she said, go ahead, just don't screw it up. That's why we've built this program. It's really about ensuring that we're going to have a higher delivery result. We're going to get to the results the organization's looking for, and then we're going to identify early if there are challenges the organization's going to have to tackle in order to get over those things. So with that, that gives you a high-level view of what the Enterprise Transformation Program is. Adam's given a great example of how we've helped them overcome the initial roadblocks. They've now freed up a bunch of capacity to go serve line of business innovation and data and analytics needs that we're starting to turn towards. We're starting to now replicate and expand that across different businesses inside of Lockheed because we now we know the recipe that works. We know the culture change that is expected. We know the resource types, the function types, the types of training and education you're going to need. And we know how to make those workshops and how to make those experiences for the people that have to do the actual work better to make them more successful. And with that, I think Adam wants to give a thank you out to some very important people that oh, came through the journey. <laughs> absolutely. I would be remiss if I, if I had the opportunity to come up here and not say thank you to everybody that helped us along this journey, uh, specifically my, my partners in crime, uh, Tim, Scott, and Steve. They'll watch this later, and I am incredibly appreciative of them. Uh, the AWS team, I mentioned Robin already, Mahendra to help us get it started. Ryan, thank you for championing that executive visioning session. Uh, Petra, Josh, John, uh, specifically John, my gosh. John and Robin, the, the, they have wonder twin powers that have just enabled us to do some really awesome things. So I'm incredibly grateful and appreciative. And our work's not done. We've, we've done a lot of great stuff. We've seen a lot of really good metrics on what we've built thus far, but our work's not done. And I think that's the really cool part. Ryan, you mentioned it about changing the culture We've changed the culture, but even though it's a 114,000 employee company, we changed the culture and we changed it here. Now we need to go and we need to expand that to the other business areas, the other programs, and really get them on board with what we're doing as well. So with that, let us open up for any questions.